The Anglophone world is an area of study and an area in the world we presume to be in an unstable state. Gressé and Mazodier could analyze the instability of this last proposition. Does the relative clause refer to Anglophone world or the world or to area of study? All three, no doubt, instability is now everywhere. Consultation of the OED suggests that states and conditions are virtually synonymous. A state can relate to a condition or manner of existing. As for condition, there is the following OED quotation, 1817 from Coleridge. The air I breathe is the condition of my life. Note its cause. Coleridge presumably believed that the air I breathe is the condition of my life is immune to any human agency or as Roland Barthes had noted, quoted by Marie-Olivier in her article on Louise Gluck, the sky, the one thing that cannot be marked. But if human agency now conditions the state of the air that I breathe, then the state of the world is now decipherable. The writing is on the wall, uh, the writing is in the sky. And this takes us into an unstable territory, one we'd read about in science fiction, while believing ourselves to be safely tucked up in the domestic or readily comfort zone. Jean-Daniel Colomb reads the writings of Bird Calicot to apprehend the changes that such man-made ecological mutation now require of us. The demarcations between village and jungle in Leonard Work's novel The Village in the Jungle, written in 1913, pointed to by Leila Hagenas, seem porous she quotes Jacques Derrida about the reappraisal of the conditions of the human, that is, our participation in transspecies animality, now apprehended more precisely than in 19th century premonitions, no longer feared now as the puncturing of a veneer of civility that liberates an underlying beastliness. Reading her, one senses that it is perhaps through the relocation of the human within the sustaining condition of its animality that anxieties manifest in the gothic fantasies of the beastly and the romantic aspirations to the angelic might be overcome. For the reader of literature, the challenge of unstable states is not the same as for a student of political systems. Zach Bastic examines the malfunctioning of the American political machine. He proposes remedies. He revisits the discussions about representation. For Richard Eicher, the intentions to decipher Don DeLillo's take on time and on the intoxication with eternity, he writes of, I quote, an opposition between an essentially poetic self-awareness, born of the experience of finitude, and a heroic or titanic drive to permanence and unity of being. I take this to mean that it is the metaphysical pursuit of permanence that has got human agency into its historical impasse through the abuse of the titanic drive to permanence and unity of being, which implies that the challenge posed by any unstable state is the challenge of keeping upright by way of a precarious balancing conditional upon precious little, more like riding a bicycle than like cruising the streets in the stretched limo seen in the David Cronenberg adaptation of DeLillo's Cosmopolis. In that direction, perhaps, like possibilities for a certain levity, one less national epic than the elation of William Carlos Williams Insofar as the argument against our being able to endorse Coleridge's sense of the immunity of air also distances us from William's claim to a new American language and a new continent. Our inability to share the confidence audible in William's voice is also conditioned by our exposure to the two counterpoint discourses of Australia, territory and water that are placed side by side by Camille Roulière. Anna Oblay, drawing on Williams, refers to language as driving of a wedge that opens the world. 
The caesura between the event and its appropriation in discourse is the condition Toby Oberk highlights in his reading of two narratives, one by an officer, the other by an ordinary seaman, of their captivity after the American frigate Philadelphia ran aground off the shores of Tripoli in 1803. To conclude with the question of colours, Rigid Anchor evokes titanic pursuit of permanence, penetration to a timeless truth to end all truths. Charlotte Ribeirol evokes a moment in high culture and in useful industry and in fashion that is the late 19th century infatuated with purple, violet, puce, mauve, indigo. That the late Victorian colours could be forced through a chemical technology made them suspect to those for whom an elevating art required the naturalness or at least the craft-based origin of the pigments through which the edifying motifs were to be depicted. The Victorians repeated the anxieties of earlier societies, notably the anxieties of the Greeks. The more conservative and colorless Plato was indeed extremely wary of the instability and restless versatility conveyed by the idea of poikilia. He resorted to this term associated with the changing scales of the serpent to compare the dem democratic regime to a shimmering coat that might appeal to women and children. The connotations of poikilia are suspect, flash, bigarre, cosmetic, the antithesis of a presumed classical sobriety. Poikilia could be the chromatic mode of a Victorian or a more recent camp culture. And as a modality of the visible world, the response to the visible world, in time and light, through language or through the materiality of paint, colour is a component of both the camp culture and of a more haughtily sublime high modernism. The demarcation between the two best regarded as itself unstable and porous. In Wallace Stevens' poem, Sea Surface Full of Clouds, 1931, Motley Hue is part of the word palette available to him to render the play between light, ocean and air. It comes to mind as a possible translation for Poikilia, the unstable status of what is motley and trickster is a condition of the beauty of the rainbow performance. I quote from the poem. The wind of green blooms turning crisped the motley hue to clearing opalescence. Then the sea and heaven rolled as one and from the two came fresh transfiguring of freshest blue.